This is, uh, I think, ground I've never covered before um, in a talk, and I thought the AAPS would be a, a perfect place to, to actually try this out. I will talk a little bit about the Surgery Center of Oklahoma, but not much. Um, and if, and I, Jeremy's told me there's some time for questions, and I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. But my, my focus today will not really be on uh, the Free Market Medical Association and the Surgery Center of Oklahoma, although if you want, if you want to ask questions about that later, then I'm happy to answer them. It, it really is with a lot of humility that I uh, accepted this invitation to speak. I remember uh, how I heard about AAPS. Uh, my, my father was a, a rabid subscriber to a Policy Review um, magazine put out by the Heritage Foundation. And there was an article that came out about um, a very courageous uh, internist uh, named Lois Copeland who had kicked uh, Medicare to the curb. And as I read this article, I thought, well, I need to know her and I need to know more about uh, this organization, uh, the AAPS. And I joined and very quickly realized, you know, felt like I was at home. Um, and very shortly after that, stopped filing uh, claims with Medicare. I still saw Medicare patients. I just, I just refused to file any more claims. And I was really inspired uh, by Dr. Copeland, of course, Jane Orient, who I called Jane of Arc. Uh, so we, and I'm very, um, you know, Michael Schlitt, my Mark Schiller is here. I think I saw him at a distance. How are you? So, I mean, just some real heroes to me in this room. And, and so I, I really did accept this invitation with a lot of humility. One of the reasons it is is very humbling is after I fired Medicare, um, there, were, there were people that wanted me to talk about it because Medicare actually sent me a letter that said, you have not used this number for... 18 months, and so we are decommissioning you. And that that letter is under glass because people have, you know, how do I get that letter? And so I kind of went on a little bit of a speaking circuit. People were kind of interested in this. And I made the mistake, I was very young at the time, of letting this a little bit go to my head. The next AAPS meeting I went to, I uh, was speaking with a young man you all know, Curtis Kane, and I was speaking to Nino Camardis, and they informed me they had never filed a Medicare claim, and I felt very small. Uh, and I remember that lesson well uh, because there are there are giants, uh, past and present, in this organization, and I really I really do appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. When I, when I think of AAPS, I think about, I think about the organization that is the, really the gatekeeper, or more appropriately, the standard bearer of the doctor-patient relationship. I think, I think more than anything, that is what that is what AAPS has been to me, and so I think it's natural to consider um, a path for our for our professional lives that best ensures that relationship. And, and that's why I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, physician entrepreneurship and how urgent it is. And I don't mean by that that you should go out and start a surgery center of Oklahoma. Uh, and I don't mean by that that you should necessarily go start uh, a hospital or a imaging facility. I think what I mean by that is we should all understand truly what entrepreneurship is and and as individuals what would make us good entrepreneurs with this goal in mind. If you actually have revenue coming to you and your family that is not downstream of your efforts as a physician, you are deleveraged. You, you now have the opportunity to weather whatever this sick 
system might throw at you. So I want to talk to you a little bit about personal and individual entrepreneurialism and how it's really quite easy to connect, to connect those dots uh, between being financially sound, not completely dependent on your uh, medical practice revenue, and how that really can translate into a situation where you truly are an uncompromised advocate for your patients. People have argued for a long time about what is entrepreneurship. I mean, you can read, uh, you can read Rothbard, you can read Mises, you can read uh, more recently Peter Klein. Uh, the Giants are uh, Frank Knight, and there are many others that have actually tried to describe what entrepreneurship is, and it's very difficult to define. But ultimately, entrepreneurship is uh, decision making in the face of uncertainty. And that makes every human being an entrepreneur, after all, because we're all making decisions in the face of uncertainty. If there were no uncertainty, then no one would do anything, because it, it, what's going to happen is going to happen anyway. There also is this component of judgment. Uh, and it's not luck, but it's judgment. Uh, and, and the good entrepreneur is the one who can anticipate uh, future consumer demand uh, better than the fellow sitting next to him. If you, if you don't anticipate com uh, future consumer demand very well, then you're not an entrepreneur anymore. I mean, you run out of money and you're broke. But using that definition, every human is an entrepreneur. Using that definition, every private practice physician in this room is an entrepreneur because you've taken risk, there is definitely uncertainty uh, these days. And, and I use the word uncertainty very carefully as distinct from the word risk. Risk, um, risk is better used to uh, think about throwing the dice where there are probabilities involved. And if you throw the dice a certain number of times, any, any number of people would calculate what the results are going to be and they would all they would all come to the same conclusion. Uncertainty is complete unknown. And that is what, that's what I think is so creepy for a lot of physicians when they entertain even thinking about being an entrepreneur. While it's so important to become, I believe, entrepreneurial, and how, as I said, I think this insulates all of us who are human from whatever leverage or temptations um, confront us with our patients. I think we also need to acknowledge the really distinct disadvantages as physicians that we have of becoming entrepreneurial. They both, I think, are, are psychological. One, one, is, one problem is that I think we bring the same risk aversion to any idea of business that we appropriately apply to our clinical decision making. So everyone in here, everyone in here that's a clinician tries to minimize the extent to which uh, patients are exposed to risk. That is not the appropriate mindset for an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur sees, sees the relationship between opportunity and risk. Uh, and, and while we all take risks in order, in order to do what we do and make sure patients can, can do well, we don't take risk unnecessarily. And I think, think that's a distinction that is blurred and why many physicians have a hard time and why we're characterized as awful businessmen. You know, you hear this all the time. Doctors are terrible businessmen. Well, there's, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is the one I just laid out. The other is, I'm going to call it a cop-out, because I think that's what it is. I've, I'm around physicians all the time, and they say, I really like what you're doing, but I just want to practice medicine. I don't want to get into the money part of this. And uh, we must understand that by taking that, taking that path, we are abandoning patients to the wolves uh, who are out there, uh, who will more than likely bankrupt them for anything that they require. I think that as individual entrepreneurs outside of the medical industry, 
Uh, we, are, we are insulated, we're not leveraged, we, we are less likely to uh, make recommendations to patients that are, that are leveraged. Uh, and, and it then, I think, gives us the opportunity to better identify um, those instances that come along where we can step in and act as patient advocates outside of our office uh, and get into the medical industry because there's a lot of opportunity there. In order to be an entrepreneur, you have to have capital. Uh, Murray Rothbard said, um, uh, anybody, that is, anybody that is forming a business plan that does not have their own capital involved is either a manager or is just merely playing at parlor games. So in order to have capital, in order to have money that you would put towards real commercial real estate or whatever it is, you have to actually borrow against that to get more capital. You actually have to live below your means for some period of time. This is also difficult, I think, for many physicians having delayed gratification for our whole career. Once, once there is some kind of a revenue stream, it is very tempting to finally live uh, up to that limit rather than live below your means. The, con the economic concept that has helped me understand this better than any is time preference. And I would encourage anyone that's not familiar with the concept of time preference to familiarize yourself. Time preference is different from person to person and it's even different in the same person over the continuum of time. Um, time preference means, it basically means that you, you prefer uh, later payment to current payment. The later payment being typically higher and the promise of the later payment being the future payment being higher than any current payment. So that means you don't spend all the money that you're making and you put it aside and you see an opportunity, say you, like my brother, and uh, he's family medicine independent uh, and he decided to live below his means for some period of time so that he could create a nest egg and then he an opportunity came along. There was a medical office building that he was able to buy for a very, very good price. He didn't spend the rent money that came in on that. He used that to buy another one and he used that to buy another one. And the next thing he knew, he had all of this revenue coming in that was basically medical, commercial, real estate, all of which stemmed from his decision to live below his means and to accumulate some capital. So his decision, very unconscious at the time though, was to forego current compensation in favor of a hopefully higher payment later. And that is the entrepreneur's life. So my brother had this real estate, had all this rental income coming in and then the local hospital decided to take over their local world. They bought all the physician practices and they formed their own HMO. And they told my brother, if you don't join our HMO, sell your practice to us, then you will be run out of town and you'll be completely out of business. He was completely insulated from this leveraged attempt and laughed out loud at this meeting. He is a perfect example of of the point I think that I'm trying to make here. He and I had many conversations late into the night when this was going on and, and it took, the conversations were very long because they were so full of laughter, there was not much substance in it. So we, we had these conversations and I told him, I said, when the patients walk into the doctor's office who is employed, they will see the difference and then they will leave and then you will have a waiting list because they'll know the difference. They'll have, in a very short period of time, seen the difference between I work for you, my patient, versus I work for somebody else. And within 18 months, he had a waiting list and his waiting room, his waiting room emptied a little bit, but he was completely able to weather this storm because he, he really did understand living below his means, accumulating capital, and 
seeing to it that there were sources of revenue. It's I mean, being diversified, basically, in the source of revenue. I also want to make it clear, this idea of being an entrepreneur isn't all about money. I mean, you may, you may want to seek another source of revenue so that, so that you can do something else. Or you may want to seek a type of a business to get involved with because it's gratifying in some other way. Um, and in addition to this concept of, of time preference, which I would encourage you all to study. And by the way, the best place to read that that I found is a, a book by Hans Hoppe called Democracy, the God that Failed. It is, it is, there are many descriptions of time preference, but I found that one particularly appealing and easy to read. But the other concept that comes from our economics friends at the Austrian School is, is the subjective theory of value. And this is a concept that uh, Karl Menger uh, in Austria is, I think, credited for coming up with. But basically, what it means is value, however you want to assign it, is completely subjective. And a Bentley sitting out in this parking lot might have a, a value to one of us that is whatever that is. It might have a different value to a monk. I mean, they may place no value on it. I mean, you know, whatever, you know, what something is worth is what someone will pay for it. And so it's, it's not a function of the labor that went into it. It's just completely, utterly subjective. And any decision you might make that is in that entrepreneurial world is subject to your subjective value. My wife and I just got back on a a trip that we have planned and planned for a long time. Um, we went to France. And we got out of Paris as fast as we could and uh, drove down to the Loire Valley. And we met uh, my new friend, Peter Cooley. Peter Cooley is the winemaker at this wonderful winery that has been in his family for 500 years without interruption. And he was very interesting. He was very brilliant, very friendly. His English was perfect. And he said, in my family, at my winery, it is not about making wine. It is about the art of making wine. And I laughed and I said, I know that story because that's the Surgery Center of Oklahoma. When Steve Lantier and I started, we had no idea if we would survive. But we knew that we were going to do it a certain way. And if the market was harsh, we weren't going to do it a different way. We were going to do it the right way. And if there was no market for doing it the right way, we just weren't going to do it anymore. Well, Peter Cooley, he makes wine in this traditional way. And if no one buys it, no one buys it. He says, I'm not going to change how I make the wine. It is the way wine should be made. So for him, it's the art. So we had this conversation and he asked me, how many people come to you and leave not fully appreciating what they've received? And I said, oh, most of them. <laughs> then he said, then why do you do it? And I said, obviously the same reason you do things the way you did. That was a real, a real epiphany. And that's why I come back to this is not all, this whole idea of entrepreneurship is not all about money and revenue. And it can be about some type of personal gratification for you as individuals uh, that, that's as rewarding as, as anything you may find. So we'll talk a little bit about in the medical world, there is, there is a lot of opportunity for physicians to be entrepreneurial in the medical space. Um, I've, I've learned a lot uh, by 
um, just nosing right up to uncertainty uh, in the ventures I've been involved with. I've made a lot of mistakes. Um, I've gained some insights that I am happy to share uh, so that the same mistakes are not yours. That, that was part of really the, the risk that my friend Jay Kempton and I took when we started the Free Market Medical Association. The Free Market Medical Association, I don't think will ever make a dime, but we took a lot of risk starting it, uh, but it's not a not-for-profit. The whole idea was to have a larger venue from which we could share insights we had gleaned from our, primarily our mistakes and somewhat our successes. There, there are opportunities like that that are, I think, available to everyone in here uh, where if you just look for them and the key to know is this an opportunity or not, is to identify friction. Is there something that is not as efficient or operating as smoothly as it should? If you, if you see friction and speed bumps, that is truly something you should look through the lens of opportunity. Uh, there, there is no one that understands the path that patients travel better than the people in this room. And I, I think about my friends, uh, Kyle Rickner and Robert Lockwood. Uh, they're both direct primary care physicians. And they saw the fear that, physician, that, that physicians had who were employed by hospitals, matched by this wild desire to get out of that situation. But the fear had the best of them, and they could not make that move. So Kyle and Robert saw this friction and realized there is a market opportunity here where we can actually fund, you know, pre-fund a soft landing for anyone who wants to jump off the building into the net. And so the doctor who, you know, what about malpractice? What about EMR? You know, what about you know, me feeding my family for the next 90 to 120 or 180 or 12 months? You know, what about that? You know, I've got to get out of this situation because I know it's immoral and it's wrong and everything about it is awful, but I'm scared to death. That was an opportunity for doctors uh, uh, Lockwood and Rickner and so they now have, they now have a, a group and they have a mechanism and a method that provides for a soft landing for someone who wants to jump out of that position. And they're not making a lot of money by doing this. They're making a little bit of money doing this, but they are so gratified and they, they love seeing, um, you know, it's like Molly said, you left Medicare go and this you know, backpack full of rocks just disappears. And they love seeing that look. That, that is gratifying and, and they are compensated in a way just by having that experience uh, even, even beyond any sort of revenue uh, that they might glean. The reason they were able, once again, the reason they were able to have the funds to fund this this new opportunity that they discovered and they actually imagined it. They, they actually had to imagine it first and then they brought it to life. But they actually had capital uh, and they had capital because they were not personally leveraged. They were not living beyond their means. Uh, and, and, and that's a point I can't drive home enough. Our ability to interact with patients in a non-leveraged way and what I mean by that is no one else is telling us what to say, do, prescribe, end of story. Our ability to do that is connected directly to our own personal finances. If we mismanage our own personal finances, it, it is going to show up eventually in the office and in some decision that we make. We're all, we're all human beings in here and temptation is what it is. I, I remember when James Langford was elected to Congress, he was 
very intrigued with what we were doing at the Surgery Center of Oklahoma, and he said, let me know if you're ever in D.C. He'd only been up there maybe a month when I had to go for some reason. I hate that place, but I went. And we met for dinner, and I listened to him for a few minutes, and I realized, this is a really good guy. I mean, he's a really good guy. And before I could catch myself, I asked him the question, what are you doing here? <laughs> this place is awful, and you're a nice guy. And he kind of laughed, and I said, no, no. And, and then it was uncomfortable for a minute, and I said, how long do you think you can remain a good guy? And I said, I'm not judging you, but I cannot fathom the temptation that you might face or the leverage you might face. I'm not judging you, but oh my God, what are you doing here? Uh, because I think mean, most of those people are thugs and he's just a good guy. And he said, I loved his answer, ask me in two years. Because I, you know, how long will it take you to fail and succumb? And he said, ask me in two years. He's still a good guy. He's, he's an unusual character. He is still a good guy. But my point is we are all human. We are all subject to temptations of various sorts, whether it's drug reps wanting to pay us for whatever, whether it's uh, you're an orthopedist and you have implant reps wanting to kick back money to you for what you're using. I mean, I can go on, uh, but to not acknowledge that there are leveraging influences, whether it's an insurance carrier that you know you are now going to do this or we're going to hit you with this whether it's medicare acknowledge the leverage in your life uh, and get rid of that is is one characteristic that i would argue is is one that belongs to successful successful entrepreneurs i think i think that it's also it's also probably useful to follow a timeline of physician entrepreneurialism. So my, my great uncle uh, was a physician named Walter Bays, and he was the only physician in a small town southwest of Oklahoma City called Chickasha. And he was that guy who got on his horse or horse and buggy in the middle of the night, drove out into the country, delivered babies, and accepted a chicken as payment. He was that guy and he was the only doctor in town. Um, his home was also the hospital. The ground floor of his home was Chickasha Hospital. They called it Bay's Hospital because he was, he was like a god in this town. He was, just, he was a wonderful man. He lived upstairs. Um, his wife did not like that arrangement, but it allowed him to accumulate capital and he did in the depression he accumulated enough capital and treating people in the most charitable kind way to build another building that was called for decades Bay's Hospital and he owned and controlled the hospital where all of his patients went that was actually the model all over the United States until these idiots uh, in, and I give them too much credit giving them ignorance, they're evil. The people in DC uh, foisted, um, and some of you might take issue with my timeline, but I believe Hill Burton, the Hill Burton Act was a disaster and that basically rained down all these government hospitals all over the country so that it became became more difficult for the Walter Bays of the world to, to compete in the facility world. But up until that point, he had complete control over the care that his patients received. And he was not just their medical advocate, he was their financial advocate. If the patient said, God, this hospital bill is awful, what can you do about it? Dr. Bays could do everything about it. I mean, he could make it go away. That's our model at Surgery Center of Oklahoma. If a patient is outraged by one of our bills, of course they're an idiot if they are because all our prices are online. But <laughs> if somebody is struggling, you know, what can you do about this? I can do everything about it. I mean, I can make it go away. And that was the model in the United States. And I, 
and there were some uh, charitable hospitals that were formed that are exceptions to that, but I know in the rural part of America, hospitals were owned and controlled and established by the physicians who worked there. I think the pendulum is swinging back that way. And I think it is a very healthy thing. It is a very scary thing. It is no, for the bad guys, it is no mistake that there is no end of legislation, federal, state, and local, to prevent this trend from accelerating. Uh, people ask me, well, why isn't this free market movement larger than it is? And said, so, are you kidding me? That it's as large as it is is, is miraculous. Uh, in, you know, in spite of everything, it continues to grow. So following Hill Burton, uh, my theory is the reason we got Medicare and Medicaid is you had all these hospitals, and they didn't want to charge patients. They wanted to plug directly into the trough. And what are you going to feed government hospitals with? Well, you're going to feed them with government money. So that, that was, a, I think, a big reason Medicare and Medicaid came along. And then there, there were these special <laughs> legislators and senators um, to whose, I, I mean, whose names are attached to some of these uh, regulations, Pete Stark, from this from this state is one of them. I googled him the other day and my god he's still alive. Um, and we all we all can celebrate the sobriety of Ted Kennedy. Um, he's also he is also one that absolutely has to be called out. Two you may not think of are uh, Charles Grassley and from my home state, Don Nichols. So Don Nichols was a champion of physician ownership of facilities and fought like a badger until the end of his term when he pushed through with Grassley legislation that made it almost impossible for physicians to own hospitals, left the Senate, opened a lobbying firm, and his first client was the American Hospital Association, paid him a million dollars. He opened that, he opened that lobbying firm with John Bro. My point is, these goons are on both sides of the aisle. Um, and as Mencken said, you know, any election is just an advance auction on others' property. And that these guys are on both sides of the aisle. Um, when I was I, I was asked to attend the signing of Trump's executive order uh, w that was, I think, historic if it's allowed to go through. And sitting on the front row, clapping like a seal, it's Charles Grassley. And you're talking about, and, and Trump at the moment sounded like a card carrying member of the Free Market Medical Association. I mean, he was saying, creating this new vibrant marketplace, and you're thinking, yeah, but this is great. And clapping on the front row is a man whose efforts have been dedicated to creating the presence of a vibrant marketplace. So I'm Charles Grassley, I think we need to acknowledge his devastating role. And I would say his effect on the, on the hamstringing of physician entrepreneurship is every bit as powerful uh, as what um, Mr. Kennedy or uh, Mr. Stark came up with. I'm going to watch these guys. So I'll finish with this. Don't spend more than you make. Seek sources of revenue outside of your practice. You owe it to your patients to at least try. And then be aware of this friction and see the friction as the opportunities that will not just set you free from the leverage you face every day, but will also insulate your patients from the wolves who just want nothing but the worst for them. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Smith. He has uh, graciously agreed to uh, take some questions. If anybody has some questions, uh, 
Please. Raise your hand and Jeremy can bring the microphone to you. Thank you. Uh, Carla Dean Graves, Kansas City Family Practice. Um, you mentioned about the younger generation coming on. And so uh, we have taken medical students um, and we are finding that they are being, I call it, prostatized because they are being taught more social, social justice uh, than they are anatomy. Um, they, um, they, they aren't, they're, they're learning about how great o uh, the ACA Obamacare is. How can we get your message out to the medical students and to the residency programs? Because this is something that we're going to have to really undertake. Um, everybody knows about the Benjamin Rush Institute, I'm hoping, in this room. So at the Free Market Medical Association, we have a lot of medical students that show up. My, my good friend, Dr. Marty McCary, does everybody know? I mean, he's everywhere, yeah. So Marty asked me at the end of our last Free Market Medical Association conference, what was my long-term goal for FMMA? And I said, you know, to get through this conference and not go broke. Uh, because we, we didn't know at the end of this last conference, like any others, you know, we're gonna have to write a check you know, to make up for whatever. I mean, we just, we don't know. There's more uncertainty than I would like. So I said, well, you obviously have something in mind. And he said, yes. He said, I want to see half of the attendees at the Free Market Medical Association next year as medical students. Well, that would be about 250 medical students the raw cost to just get them there and have them there is $1,000 each. So he's talking about a quarter of a million dollars. So there's actually a benefactor that is kicking this around. There is someone who is, who is out there and is really trying to make a difference, who has not spent everything they've made and they have this kind of capital, and those talks are ongoing. So there is a, there is a very good chance that we will have a fund that size, and of course I'm gonna leverage that and you know, tell people, you know, we're, gonna, we're gonna see if she'll match too, and see if that can happen. But I you know, would like to see 250, 300, 400 students at our next uh, FMMA conference and the message at that conference is, is perfect for the students. I mean, it really is. And the message here is too, that it, we have a very strong direct primary care component that attends. Um, there, are, there are people in the industry that are good guys in the industry that can actually tell them how it really does work. There are guys in the industry who used to be bad guys who can tell them what to watch for. And so it's a real eye-opening experience for uh, students. So I, I love talking to young people, um, and, I, and I do so every opportunity that I can. Uh, the thing that I've found that resonates is to ask them this simple question. Freedom is a good idea except for blank. How do you fill in that blank? How do you respond to someone who fills it in differently from you. What does that conversation look like? How did you come up with your answer? Now I tell them personally, I think freedom is a good idea, period. But I'm willing to have a conversation with any of you that disagree, but it's alarming at how many people would put healthcare in that blank. And, and some of them won't acknowledge it even though they would. Like I say, okay, then let's just abolish Medicare and Medicaid. Oh no, okay, well then that's in that blank. Let's have that conversation. Then what does that look like if that blank is not full of health care? So young people want to be left alone. I, I say we're all libertarians for ourselves. You know, it's all you that can't be trusted with that freedom. I'm okay with it. So 
The young people want to be left alone. They, they hate injustice, they hate hypocrisy, and that is what energizes them, but they want to be left alone. And the, when they start to wrap their minds around, if I, if I fill that blank in in a way that curtails someone else's freedom, that can blow back on me just like that. Young people get that. So I'm actually optimistic. I think, um, I think people are going to make a lot of mistakes. Some people have to actually make the mistake before they change their ways. But I'm, I'm actually very optimistic about the young people. Just one real quick question is, uh, I'm setting up a direct primary care clinic in a couple of weeks. So oh, cool. curious, what tactics the hospital used against your brother? I'm sorry, what? What, what tactics did the uh, hospital <coughs> use against your brother when you guys were, they were trying to force you out? So they, they undercut him with pricing, uh, and they had his, and patients thought, you know, I don't, I'm not going to have to pay anything. I mean, it, they used right loss the leaders I mean, to empty his right waiting room. Um, and, you know, and they had this hospital HMO, and okay. you don't have to pay anything when you come in. So there, there were some people that, that succumbed to that, and, the, and then it was just intimidation and threats. You know, we, you know, we, we can't promise this won't affect your hospital privileges. You know, we got the expert on that here, but just lots of intimidation and threats. But he knew by that point he could quit practicing. He could quit. And, you know, that's the other thing. Recognize having gone to school forever, like we all have, that in itself is leverage. To say, I'm not going to be a doctor anymore. There are business people everywhere that say, this is not good anymore. I've got to do something else. That's harder for us because we've invested a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of money and a lot of passion. But ultimately, that is the leverage that, that they kind of inflicted on him is you may not actually be able to be a physician in this environment and survive. And he laughed. Congratulations, by the way. Keith, uh, hi, Dean Waltman here. We've spoken before. Um, as many of you know, I'm, uh, shall we say, a fervent advocate of all the things you're doing. Basically, it boils down to uh, the freedom to do what we know is right for our patients rather than being forced by a clinical algorithm or a bureaucrat or uh, an insurance executive to do what's best for their pocketbook. My question is, my sort of more statement, but question is this. I think we need to go further than simply do what you're saying, and that is we need to take a leadership role, we physicians, need to take a leadership role for our patients to educate them as to what it really means, Medicare for all, what it really means, what government takeover of healthcare really means. Rather, I have been trying for years to, to encourage old people like me, senior guys who've been around for a while, to take a more active role in not becoming politicians, but in the political sphere. And I, I have to say, I think I have failed almost uniformly because all the clinical doctors are saying, I don't have time. Uh, I don't understand this stuff. I don't have an MBA like you, et cetera, et cetera. And with all due respect, I have to say we are abrogating or at least ignoring, and I'd like your response to this, ignoring a requirement, in my view, for the best interests of we the patients. I think we have to take a leadership role in educating them and telling them at the end of the day, the cure for health care is to get Washington out of it. Yes. Well, I think there are a lot of people in this room that have taken that challenge on. My friend Michelle Codd sitting behind you, he's front and center. In his podcast, the Codd and Coca Report, is required, required listening for everyone in here. It's just genius. Uh, now, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> but there, there are a lot of, what's that? A cod and coca, ACC. He's right back there. Stand up, Michelle. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
it's, it is the best medical podcast out there. So there are a lot of people in this room, and David Ballett's here. I mean, my gosh, you're walking around the country with a megaphone. There, there are a lot of people in here that are, that are doing just that and really and have done for some time, just really heroic stuff. One, one point I'd like to make, <clears throat> I would encourage you all, because I've had conversations with people in this room in the past where I think this was blurred, to distinguish between the payment arrangement that you have in your office with the patient to the payment arrangement the patient has with the institution where they receive their imaging, their surgery, whatever. I accept by many definitions in this room third party payment. The payment I receive as an institution at the Surgery Center of Oklahoma comes from a third party that buys on behalf of a group of people who work for these companies that, and these companies have completely rejected insurance. They have told Blue Cross to go to hell and they are actually paying these bills. Because they're large enough, they have actually some power in the marketplace, but they're at, through ERISA, they're actually spending that employee's money, but they are a third party. So I would encourage you to wrap your minds around that. I would argue that accepting payment from them as an institution is perfectly moral and ethical, but it's different. <laughs> it's different than the arrangement that any one of you might have in your office. I know DPC doctors are real divided on this. Should we accept money from third party administrators? You know, well, I just want to get my money from the patient and then if somebody reimburses them on the backside, then it feels normal and that's what a lot of them do. But that, that is a distinction I would like for you all to at least have on your radar. Yes. You recommended a book. Could you give me the title again? Uh, one book I recommended, The Description of Time Preference, is Hans Hoppe's Democracy, the God that Failed. That was it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good one. Thank you. There was a young doctor who just finished his residency I met in Florida who happened to come from our hometown and wants to start a DPC. So. We met with him and he said he would love to do this. His problem is that he and his wife have $500,000 worth of medical school debt. Now, if he comes to work for me, he's just got to work that off. If he goes to work for the big hospital, the Robert Wood Johnson Hospital Complex, which is not for profit, the federal government gives him loan forgiveness. Now that is just an incredibly, um, uh, just an unfair, an unfair advantage that the hospitals have over the private practice physician. <clears throat> One advantage, but there's so many. I mean, it's just like, it's horrifying what they have done, what the legislators have done. Yeah, and I told someone earlier, let's bash the insurance companies, let's bash the PBMs, uh, let's bash the big hospital systems. They all deserve bashing, but you have to keep your eye on the ball. The, the devil is the federal government. They, they are the devil, and, and whether it's ignorance or evil, it doesn't matter. They are the engine, they are the gasoline that, I, I tell people, I tell people, I say the most awful things about the medical industrial complex, but Uncle Sam is driving the getaway car. So you really have to keep that in mind. Uh, do you have time for one more question, Dr. Yeah. Smith? Are you doing yeah. okay? Hi, Bob Campbell from Pennsylvania again. I've been reluctantly pulled into a giant tank battle between AHIP and the American Hospital Association, a thing called balance billing, or what I call it, uh, uh, promulgation of narrow networks to leverage monopoly positions. And I'm curious, <clears throat> the physician, we haven't figured out what we're gonna say. I'm interested in your perspective, where you're coming from, is are narrow networks a, a threat or do you see it as an opportunity? I think they're both. 
uh, if the patient Sorry. has choice, I think a narrow network can be a good thing. So some of the employers that I deal with say, you know, you can go wherever you want to go to have your, you know, cholecystectomy, but if you go here, I'll pay the whole bill. So I think of narrow networks more as an additional tier of coverage benefit. So wrap your mind around this. So merciless hospital system. Uh, that's what that's what they call it. So <clears throat> mercy is out of network for all of the employers that I deal with. We have 300 contracts with people all over the United States that fly their employees from Alaska, Maine, Florida to Oklahoma City to have their surgery. But people in Oklahoma, if they go to Mercy, they're actually out of network. If they come to Surgery Center of Oklahoma, they pay nothing. So that, that is the opportunity lens through which I would see narrow networks if, and this is evil, as one large self-funded employer told their employees, if you have if you have a spine issue, you have to go to this hospital. Behind everyone's back, they made this deal with the hospital. Said, here are the criteria that we think are appropriate for spine surgery. Can we agree on that? Yes. It was pretty limited. If more than 25% of these people have surgery, our arrangement's over. That's not okay. And that is, that's a narrow network. That's not okay. And somebody told me that, who knows? That, that's not okay. So, yes and no. Isn't that gross? Okay. It's incredible. We've got to let him get to the airport. Yeah, I think we got, uh, Dr. Smith, thank you very much. Yeah, for thank it. you guys very much. Thanks, Dr. Smith. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.